morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Wrocław debate, as we call it, where the motion will be, are politicians undermining European democracy? I'm the moderator, Norman Davis. I'm a writer and historian, but I'm here in my capacity as an honorary citizen of the great city of Wrocław and as a known disciplinarian. It's my job to keep the panel in order and to make sure that in the second half of the proceedings there's time for questions and discussions with people from the floor. In his introduction uh, to the forum, our co-host Fred Kemper of the Atlantic Council described how the forum has grown over the last five years from being an experiment to being an established item on the international circuit. Uh, this debate, we hope, is on the same traje trajectory. Last year, at the first appearance, it was definitely an experiment. This year, after favorable comments about our efforts last year, um, uh, we were kindly invited to uh, have another session on a different topic and with uh, different uh, speakers. Uh, the first session was definitely an, an experiment. This year, uh, I think we're on the road to becoming a fixture, a sort of gadfly or pep-up event which complements the main uh, items of the program while having a slightly different flavor. Now to introduce the panelists, uh, our main speaker uh, on your left is Judy Dempsey, uh, well known to many of you, I'm sure, as uh, the European correspondent of the International Herald Tribune. As you will hear when she speaks, uh, she uh, has an Irish background and, uh, as the Irish say, possesses the gift of the gab. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure as a uh, youngster she was taken to kiss the Blarney Stone, yeah. um, uh, which is one of the great uh, sites in Ireland. Um, she resides in Berlin, literally uh, just down the road from here, uh, and is surprisingly well um, informed about Poland and has been here many times. Uh, the second pa panelist in the middle is Susanna Verni, who is a professor in the Department of Politics at the University of Athens in Greece. Uh, and she will start by uh, saying something about uh, Greek politics. She's a Greek citizen, but of definitely British origin. Uh, indeed, uh, she used to be a student in my department at London University. Um, we had a very interesting exchange of emails uh, uh, in which she said, if you are the Norman Davis that I remember, uh, I am the Susan Verney who was a student in your department. Um, so we're very pleased to see you both here. Uh, the third panelist on your right is John Martin. Uh, already well known in, in Wrocław. He is a, an unashamed Vratislavophile. Um, his hobby is cardiology, <laughs> uh, in which he holds two uh, distinguished chairs, one at University College in London and the other at Yale in the United States. But in his other uh, 
uh, incarnations. I should mention he was once uh, an officer of a Gurkha regiment. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, he's a philosopher who studied philosophy <coughs> in Salamanca in Spain. Uh, he's a painter uh, and he's a poet. I uh, published one of his poems uh, at the end of my history of the Second World War in Polish, Europa Walczy, and many people uh, took notice of that. I brought John here three or four years ago, uh, and he was so enchanted by the city, I don't think that's a, an exaggeration, uh, that his reaction was, we must do something to put this wonderful place on the map. And this debate was John's idea. <coughs> As everyone knows, uh, Europe is in crisis. But many people have been led to believe that the crisis is essentially economic and financial in nature. We hear of economic imbalances in the Eurozone and of the stupendous sovereign debts that have accumulated uh, in the so-called pigs countries, uh, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain, and not only. Great Britain, uh, I think, is not far off the list. Uh, but there are other critical elements. One is the so-called democratic deficit within the structures of the European Union itself. In particular, the problems of the role of the European Parliament. Another is the perceived lack of vision and leadership among the European political elite who have been described as sleepwalkers drifting into the future without purpose or direction. Thirdly, there's the rather dismal sight of moribund political systems within the member states, where the public engage in politics ever less willingly, and where in some countries, like Great Britain, they seem to be losing faith in the European project itself. So we are going to examine <coughs> the proposition that the root cause of these various failings lies less in the manifest economic and financial problems, but more in the incapacity, the inability of the politicians to tackle them. I should add, uh, as a final word, that here in Poland, the political scene is far from healthy. Foreigners tend to hear about the successful economic story in Poland. How Poland avoided recession and has maintained growth when all around we're losing it. And when we listen to fine ministers like Radek Sikorski, who was here yesterday, we get the impression that Poland is in strong, competent, purposeful hands. What foreigners don't hear is that Poland's domestic political scene is pretty unhealthy. At the present time, the party with the highest ratings in the opinion polls is fundamentally opposed to the democratic system introduced in 1989 and quite clearly is hoping to replace it with something else more authoritarian and possibly more sinister. We may get onto that in the second half. So now, Judy Dempsey, over to you. Thank you. 
over there? Sorry? Do I have to stand no, up? No, no, no. Oh, sit down. Oh, good. No, it's a free country. You... <laughs> this has fallen off. It's all by design. So, um, can you hear me? Is that okay? Um, well, thank you, Professor. Let the doctor help you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Doctor. <laughs> this was all planned. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much, uh, Norman, for a lovely presentation. And I always have to try to remember to say thank you to the hosts. Um, I'm not, and I'm not being obsequious. I love being in Wrocław, and I, and I know Mayor Dukevich quite well. He gave me, he's, he gave me so much time uh, three years ago on a very cold spring evening in his offices to talk about Wrocław and the city in Europe. So thank you very much for having me. I've been asked to deal with an, an unbelievably complex issue about democracy and are politicians um, responsible. And it's, it's, it's a very challenging subject because the democracy we are talking about is post-war Europe and that's how, how it has developed. And one of the most extraordinary aspects and the most su successful things about post-war Europe is not only the Franco-German relationship and this extraordinary peace deal that they've done, this is the enlargement. And we're sitting here and the fact that I can cross the border and in a, in a car and come up in two and a half, three hours and poles come the other direction, go from, from here to Dublin and in my homeland there are many, many poles and now the Catholic Church is thriving once again. But <laughs> this, is, this is a remarkable testimony to this extraordinary success of enlargement. And the enlargement did two things. It, um, it gave... I still believe it created a new citizenship. It gave citizens a stake in their society. And we saw this in the first, uh, the first couple of elections immediately, not only when the communist system fell, but particularly after enlargement. It was a real sense of, yes, we've come home. This is our home, this is Europe, and we're going to make something out of it. Now, yes, the younger people have made a huge amount out of it, uh, educating abroad, working abroad, traveling, and coming back as well. And that's the, that's the very interesting thing, that um, a, a lot of people do go back. Those who stay, they contribute to societies. But what have we seen over the past couple of years? It's not, and I think I agree with Norman, it's not solely the economic crisis, although it has fed into it. What we have seen is a, um, two things. One is that when certain countries do join the EU, the, the push for further reforms stops. And I'm not talking about the big structural reforms. I must say, I mean, you've gone through an enormous amount since uh, 1989, especially this country with the shock therapy. The reforms stop in the terms of the participation levels, in the voter turnout, and in the, in the, and in the enthusiasm for political participation. And the new member states, they're not new anymore, by the way, um, the, the member states who joined in 2004 and later uh, laterally remain in Bulgaria, there's a, an immense disillusionment with the political elites. Might I say, you have this also in West European countries. And in the country I live in, and which I know best, Germany, um, there's not only huge disillusionment with the established parties, what is fascinating is that there's an enormous spread of political movements against an airport, against uh, shopping centres, against um, um, passing nuclear, uh, nuclear waste through certain uh, of the states. And there's an immense groundswell of grassroots organisations, which I actually think is very, very good, but on the other hand, it's a signal to the political elites that actually there's a lack of communication between them and the grassroots. Now, the politicians, certainly in Germany, are trying to address this by tapping into the internet and Facebook and the social media. It's hard to know if, um, if this will be manifested in the elections uh, coming up in September, but there is a, a growing crisis of not legitimacy, of participation, of trust in the established political parties. Now, Germany is perhaps one of the few cases now in Europe where it has successfully, because of its history, kept loudly and solidly speaking out against the rise of the far right wing. And it is there in Germany. Um, and this constant, constant criticism of it, constant checking. 
and um, the, when the far right wing parties do get three or four percent in the polls, it's a shock, even at the look in the state elections. Interestingly, when they do manage to cut uh, to pass the five percent threshold in some of the states in Germany, and you know Germany is a federal state, thankfully they make such a hash of politics that they're kicked out. Mm -hmm. or else they just resign, or else they are prone to infighting. This is a, a, a very good thing. Um, so, I mean, Germany is one, one of the few countries that actually says, this, we are, this is not tolerant. Now, what we have seen, um, I'm going to deal with the issue of the far right in Europe first, and then go on to something, uh, another issue. The far right in Europe is... Um, it, and actually answers Professor Davis' question. The politicians are actually undermining the democratic system by pandering to the far right. The far right is the populist call, it's the call of intolerance, it's the call of the, the fear of the unknown, the fear of globalization, the fear of the foreigner. But yet, I mean, it is, it is immigration and foreigners who make up these societies in Europe. It is the far right who actually tries to get onto the agenda of the main established political parties. And what do the main political parties do? Certainly in the UK, we've seen it in France, um, we see it a tiny bit in Spain, um, uh, Susanna will speak of it later, they pander to them and they, they, uh, they integrate some of their values, uh, I wouldn't call them values, some of their ideas, instead of saying, this is what we stand up for. These are our values of democracy, of accountability, of respect, of human rights. These are the values that make Western liberal democracies. And instead of taking them on their terms, on, on the established party's terms, on the democratic terms, they actually, as I said, take some of these ideas on board. This is, um, this is going down the road towards damaging democracy, firstly. Secondly, damaging the fabric of societies and of accountability and of the individual trust in, in, the, in the role of the political party to actually protect and express human and civil rights. And when we talk about human rights and civil rights, these are not for non-democratic countries. They are things we have to cherish and respect in Europe. In the, in, I'm not going to talk, talk about the EU institutions, but in Europe. This is one of the great... Um, and it's one of the great shames that is facing the established parties in Europe. We see it in Scandinavia, we see it in Holland and France. This is the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make, and since we're sitting in Poland, um, and your neighbours are not in very good shape, it is the rampant corruption in some of these countries. Um, we have seen it um, certainly in the Czech Republic, the Czech Republic's politics uh, is mind-boggling. It is, it is so for such a, it is so out of sync with the, with the, with the ambitions of, I haven't called the ambitions of the Czechs, but the Czech history and what they have done over the centuries. It is, it is the politics of me mediocrity and the politics of lack of ambition. This is a great shame for the Czech Republic. Romania, I find, um, I can understand it, but it's no excuse. Even though they have been in the EU now for four or five years, the, the inability, the inability to shake off not only the, the appalling legacy of the communist rule, but actually perhaps the legacy of the Ottoman rule and, and the Greek fanariots who actually um, mm -hmm. controlled part of the tax collection in Romania in the 19th century, uh, in the early 20th century. Romania is so corrupt that I, in my constant talks with young people, either in Romania or in Brussels, their first solution to tackling the crisis of their country, and it is a systemic crisis, it is one of dysfunctioning democracy, is to get out. Simply leave if they can. And so many young people in, in Romania, so many talented people, as soon as they finish their degrees, or indeed if they can study uh, through the Erasmus system in Europe, they get out. And what you're left is with a political class that is really not held sufficiently accountable. The elections are not good enough in Romania. It requires something far more radical to, to cut off this systemic corruption and this systemic... Um, Absence. It's an extraordinary lack of rule of law, especially on the provincial level, where the EU um, mechanisms and imp implementation reforms actually don't penetrate right through. This is a, a, um, it, it undermines democracy. And at the end of the day, the politicians are responsible for this. The EU is not the fixer. 
the EU is not the doctor or the, you knock on the door and they provide all the solutions and all the medicine and all the money. No. It must come th from the civil society and it must come from the politicians. It really does require leadership. I'm very, very worried about Romania. Bulgaria is, by the way, not far better. There's no need to touch on, on Bulgaria because it's, it's the problems, I say, are similar. And if you proceed up the Danube and you reach Budapest, I actually, um, I actually find it uh, very sad to see how Viktor Orban, who I knew very well as a dissident, and now who has used his two-thirds majority, his Fidesz party, to, um, to impose a very strange kind of politics over Hungarian society. When you speak to Fidesz, their argument is, uh, by the way, if they're willing to be challenged on it, their argument is, well, we are just undoing the mistakes of the former socialist, former communist government. Actually, they're playing far worse tactics than the former communists. They weren't, there, there was, there's no angels here, um, but uh, I think Orban is, is actually causing an awful lot of damage, not only Hungary's reputation, but to the Hungarian citizenship, to the Hungarian body polity. And it's very, very interesting now that when you go to Hungary or you discuss this in Budapest or, or in Brussels or Berlin, the society is so polarised, it is so poisoned, that it's very, very difficult to have a serious debate. And if you cannot have a debate about your country's political system, it says a lot about the vitality of the democracy. I hold the politicians in Hungary absolutely responsible for undermining democracy. And I, the civil society, you can see it through uh, the, the, the internet and the blogs, they are, trying to, they are trying to respond, but when you have a media and increasingly the judges and increasingly the power of Fidesz's patronage, reaching out to the countryside, to the farmers, to the small enterprises. This is a recipe for disaster. This is a recipe for undoing the slow democracy that Hungary has tried to build up over the years. One more point about Hungary, and it applies to all the post-communist countries. Look, I, I, I was in these countries from 1980, and I have no illusions how difficult a transformation is. Um, I think West Europeans have deluded themselves to think that you can transform a society with a reform here, a structural reform there, some money here, some money there. It's, it's a generational thing, but it demands an awful lot of work. Democracy building and transformation is so long. And when you reread, um, and I'm sure the professor of cardiology here will, will touch on this, when you read uh, Saramoga, the great Portuguese writer of the Spanish novels, you see, my... Thank God they joined the EU, because this is, uh, democracy has flourished in these countries. Europe would have been potentially so unstable had enlargement not reached out to them very, very, very early on. And so I go back to my original point that enlargement is a very good thing, but I have no illusions about the transformation. I would say on my one last point is, uh, and I think it's very important for Poland. Um, Poland is, is, a, is an immensely proud country. And, and, it, and so it should be. I heard yesterday from, um, a, very, uh, from, a, from a, a foreign office official who was on one of the panels, well, we have to be modest. Well, I heard this at a debate the previous night in Berlin, Germans have to be modest. No, it, it is very important to have ambition. To, it's very important to have ambition so that you can bring a young people in the society along to say what kind of society you're trying to build in terms of education and participation. A lack of ambition means a lack of ambition for your democracy because this actually tries to encourage participation. Now, a few weeks ago, Viktor Orban visited Poland and he gave a lecture. It was packed out to the Kaczynski, to Kaczynski's party, um, law and justice. Uh, law and, uh, sorry, I don't want to call it Erdogan's party. <laughs> this isn't irrelevant. And it was, it was, a, it was a, it, it, this man really tapped into something. He was an orator. Um, they, they, Putin likes him. Fidesz likes Putin. The Kaczynski supporters, they loved Orban. And there was a question and answer afterwards. He said, how did you do it? How did you do it? I mean, you can see they want this two-thirds majority because can you imagine the power, what you can do with constitutional change, what you can do for society? How did you do it? And Oban said, first thing, 
media. Get your hands in the media. And they roared and they laughed, and, and then there was more private discussions. This is a warning. We need Poland as the biggest country in, in this part of Europe, and a very important middle-sized country. We need Poland as a major voice in Visegrad to speak out against what is happening in Hungary and to protect not passively its democracy, but to protect actively its democracy in its own country and its neighbors. If you don't do this, two things happen. You undermine the benefits of enlargement, the political benefits. Secondly, you undermine the very values that we as Europeans stand for, which are democracy, decency, tolerance, respect, and the fundamental human rights of the freedom of expression. And thirdly, what we lose most of all is our respect vis-a-vis -vis our eastern neighbours. Our eastern neighbours are starving for democracy. Let nobody tell you that what the Turks are doing, oh well, this is just, uh, these are, uh, Erdogan calls them the rabble rousers. They are demonstrating in the streets for the same things that you demonstrated for in the, in the early 80s. And that's the freedom of expression and decency and human rights and the political feedback and legitimacy of the leaders. The leaders once in power must never lose touch with um, those who put them in. Just to finish on the eastern, uh, the eastern frontier, if, if we don't defend these benefits, if we don't defend our own values, we have actually we lose the moral high ground when we talk to Belarus, the, the civil society in Belarus, or Ukraine, or Moldova, or uh, Armenia. These countries are going through very, very, very difficult phases. And what we have to do is check ourselves and ask ourselves, do we really have the authority to tell them how, how we can encourage them if we are not prepared to defend in every possible way our own values? Politicians, you are responsible for this weakening of democracy. And politicians, watch out. It's civil society now who must check this and strengthen democracy in Europe despite the economic crisis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Judy, for a very beautiful, if I may say, and, and passionate statement. Um, exactly what we need at 10 o'clock in the morning to, uh, to start <laughs> thinking. Uh, now, uh, it's the turn for Susanna to t tell us about Greece, where she's lived for longer than I dare say. Um, <laughs> but it is another case study of the problems that uh, Judy was discussing. Thank you, Norman. Um, one of the key ideas that's been discussed over the last couple of days, that's been kind of underlying some of the discussions over the last couple of days, has been the potential role that the EU can play as a promoter of democracy. And this idea is, of course, based on enlargement. So we come back to the starting point of what you were saying as well, Judy. The credibility of the EU in this area rests on its important role in the past through enlargement. And that uh, promotion of democracy through enlargement, of course, started with Southern Europe. And it started specifically with Greece. And therefore, I think that what's happening in Southern Europe now, and particularly in Greece, is very important and potentially undermining the credibility of the EU's role as an external democracy promoter as well. So Greece, first of all, we should say, um, the establishment of the democratic system in 1974 was a big success story. At least until recently, we were teaching the Greek case study as an example of successful democratic transition and consolidation that happened fast, that led to the establishment of a stable democratic system in a country which previously to 1974, throughout the 20th century, had had a series of military coups, regime changes, um, and culminating with the military dictatorship of 1967 to 1974. And this changed after 1974, and in particular, the democratic success story of Greece was regarded very much as a European integration success story. Uh, the European community responded very strongly in 1967 to the abolition of democracy in the 
a state that was regarded as the cradle of democracy. And the European community was very proud of its role in imposing sanctions on Greece, its first experience with democratic sanctions, and then subsequently, through the offer of EC membership, after the fall of the dictatorship, in providing the framework within which democracy could flourish in Greece. So in fact, democracy and European integration have become very closely interlinked meanings in Greece, as I think in other countries subsequently. So this means that the Greek case study is actually quite important for the credibility of the European Union's role in promoting democracy. And this makes it a matter of great concern what's happening in Greece right now. What's happening in Greece right now is, of course, a very serious challenge to democracy. The economic crisis led to major discontent with the two political forces which were regarded as responsible for getting Greece into the fiscal mess that it's in. And this resulted in May 2012 in their massive electoral punishment. So the two parties which together had, for the previous two decades, systematically gained over 80% of the vote, except for the previous two elections when they had fallen marginally below 80%, suddenly were reduced in May 2012 to 35% of the vote. That was in the elections of rage and despair, as I call them, the elections of May 2012. And in the repeat elections, which happened six weeks later, they were only able to raise this to 40%. This was in the context of a, a climate of reflection on where Greece was going and whether Greece actually wanted to remain part of the European integration project. Uh, in there, so we had the destabilization of what had been a very stable democratic system based on strong one-party majority governments with an alternation in power between the two major parties. And in particular, we had the collapse of one of the most successful socialist parties in Western Europe, which in 2012 was reduced to a third of its previous vote in 2009, and subsequently in the opinion polls has been reduced to about half of what it gained in 2012. It's currently polling around 6% and appears to be the fifth party of those that are represented in the Greek parliament. <coughs> in its place, we had the emergence of a party of the radical left as the official opposition. But the most disturbing uh, aspect of what is happening in Greece has been the emergence of a neo-Nazi party. Now, this is quite extraordinary in a country which suffered so much during the Nazi occupation. It's quite extraordinary that we have a party which actually praises Hitler. Its members of parliament have been criticized for making Nazi salutes in parliament. Um, and this party not only entered parliament in May 2012 with almost 7% of the vote, contrary to expectations, it was returned to parliament with only a very slightly reduced margin in the June election six weeks later, everybody expected this would be a flash in the pan and it would disappear, it wasn't. And what the opinion polls now show systematically from the autumn onwards, so this is now some months, is that this party is the third party in the Greek political system with around 10% of the vote. So this is extremely alarming. This is a party which is definitely an anti-system party it is a party which is known for its incitations to racial hatred. Its members of parliament have been captured on video involved in violent incidents against migrants. And uh, <coughs> one of its members of parliament, in fact, last week got up in parliament and said he was a Holocaust denier. I mean, this is a very, very serious party indeed, and I think that it's, it's one of the most scary parties in Western Europe today. And as somebody, as Norman said, I've lived in Greece for several decades, it's very scary to see a country which had made such a successful move to democracy turning towards such anti-democratic alternatives. Now, what is behind this? What is behind this is disillusion with democracy. And this was actually very well reflected in last autumn's Eurobarometer, in the standard questions about trust in national political institutions, we find that Greece 
had the lowest levels of trust in political parties in the European Union. 94% didn't trust political parties. The highest levels of no trust in government, 91%. And 89% which didn't trust parliament. And this particular, the, the lack of trust in parliament mm. is particularly alarming mm. because <coughs> in the past, um, there had been a certain amount of lack of trust in political parties, not on this scale, but political parties hadn't been highly trusted in Greece, but parliament had been trusted. So now there has been a delegitimation of the whole political system. <laughs> Behind this is, of course, the irresponsible behaviour of the Greek political elites, mm. which betrayed the dream of democracy, which built a clientelistic state, which meant inclusion if you carried the party card of either of the two main parties which alternated in power, and an extremely corrupt state. And Judy talked about corruption in some of the countries in this region. Well, Greece, of course, has for long been known as one of the most corrupt countries in the European Union as well. And this corruption extends to all kinds of everyday transactions. Um, if you want to get something out of customs, for example, it's a good idea to pass a few notes over the counter, um, hospitals and so on. And there's been a climate of immunity around corruption, and this is very important. So even now, after the explosion of the economic crisis, even after the elections of rage and despair of last year, there is still a climate of immunity with regard to those who have been involved. We have a court case against the former Minister of Defence going on at the moment, and we have some investigations into tax evasion, which <coughs> have in, appear mm. to involve a former Minister of, the, of Finance, mm. of the Economy. Um, but this is the tip of the iceberg, and everybody knows this is the tip of the iceberg, so that there is a climate of immunity which is seriously undermining democracy. Mm. Mm. But another very important aspect is, of course, economic exclusion. Now, one of the problems of Greece that we hear about continually is the lack of economic competitiveness. What this has meant is that Greece did not build a strong private sector, mm. and the, the private sector that it did build, build has been heavily based on a close link with the state. Mm. Therefore, having the party card has actually been all important. So private companies, if they want to get state contracts, it's a good idea to have close relations with the party that's in power at the moment. And this has meant uh, very limited job prospects in the private sector for young people. There was always a very strong emphasis in the past on getting jobs in the state sector. All my students, their ambition was to get a job in the state sector. What the economic crisis has meant, and the fiscal retrenchment that we're undergoing, is of course that there are now no jobs in the public sector, and those who are in the public <coughs> sector are um, in danger of losing their jobs. So the economic exclusion, which has led to disillusion with democracy, has of course become much worse with the crisis. So I think we need to bear in mind that there are all the fact in the, in the democratic dissatisfaction in Greece, there are all the factors which produce the crisis, the clientelism, the corruption and so on, but there are also the consequences of the crisis. And one of the consequences of the crisis, of course, has been the enormous rise in unemployment. Unemployment in Greece was below 10% consistently from the early 1990s onwards. In the mid-2000s, uh, it actually fell below 8%. <laughs> it's now 27%. So this is a very sharp rise. The most damaging aspect of this, of, of all, of course, is the, the unemployment of young people, yeah. which has risen to 62%. Absolutely stunning. This means that two out of three young people are out of a job and with no prospects. And of course, those who are in jobs, and I'm talking here with experience of my own students, they may have a university degree, and they're probably selling coffee in Starbucks, which is not what they envisaged doing when they spent four years acquiring a degree in political science. 
So this is corroding democracy in Greece, and this is creating a large group who, of course, are natural supporters for the neo-Nazi party. Many analysts seem to think that the neo-Nazi party is going to go away. I don't see it going away. It has a natural constituency out there, which is all the people who are suffering from the crisis. So I think we need to be aware that the, the crisis of democracy in Greece is likely to get worse rather than better. Um, in this respect, I'd just like to say really quickly that I think that the European Union has underestimated the democratic consequences mm. of the economic crisis. Mm. I'm, I'm afraid that during the crisis for the EU, democracy in Greece has been an optional extra. It hasn't been high on the EU agenda. And this was very apparent, for example, in the autumn of 2011, when the then government's parliamentary majority collapsed. There were very strong messages from the EU that Greece should not actually proceed to hold elections, yes, that elections were a luxury yeah. that a country in this economic situation could not afford, mm. and therefore we didn't have elections. Again, in the spring of last year, there were very strong messages coming from the EU embassies that really you should not be going to elections. This country is in a crisis state. Of course, we did have elections, fortunately, because to a certain extent it defused some of the tension. I don't know what would have happened in Greece if we hadn't had elections last spring. And also, the messages that the EU is getting from Greece, uh, is, is giving to Greece, have very often been that there is a much stronger interest in Greece meeting its economic commitments than in concerns about democracy. And here I would just like to mention that the recent <coughs> backpedalling of the Greek government with regard to the submission to Parliament of an anti-racism law, which it had promised uh, to the European Commission, to the Council of Europe and so on, would be submitted immediately to Parliament, has not had the same kind of reaction from the EU that um, not fulfilling economic commitments has had. So I think that there's, there's, a, there's a very clear EU role that could be played here and is not being played. So just to sum up, if we're talking about the effects of enlargement, the democratic benefits of enlargement can actually go backwards, and they can go backwards after decades. Mm. Remember that Greece's <coughs> democratic transition occurred a decade and a half before the democratic transitions in this area. So it can happen, and it can happen much later. There is no room for complacency. Mm. Uh, and secondly, although Greece is an extreme example, um, some of the pattern of what we're seeing in Greece has also been reflected across the other countries in southern Europe, which of course are suffering similarly high levels of youth unemployment. And what we have seen in the other southern European countries since 2011 has been rising abstention levels, the ousting of incumbents at every election, and the rise of challenger parties, not parties quite as disquieting for democracy as the neo-Nazi Golden Dawn in Greece, but parties which do seem to be undermining the, the democratic settlement in these countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that very clear exposition. Uh, I find it very... Um, Disappointing. I remember Greece as the dictatorship of the, uh, of the colonels, and we felt that all that had been put behind us. Uh, the con there'd been a, uh, a transformation, and the, uh, the country <laughs> where democracy was invented uh, had moved back into the dem democratic sphere. And uh, what, 30, 40 years later, we find. Uh, that the picture is not so simple or so, mm. so happy. John. <coughs> oh, thank ah. you, Norman. Oh. <laughs> I think the tradition, Norman, is that ladies sit down and gentlemen stand. Oh, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank the president of Wrocław for his invitation. And uh, I can see from England that Wrocław is becoming a flagship city in, in Europe. And congratulations on that. The previous two speakers, I think, have been very negative and depressing. Uh, and I, I agree with them. 
But what I hope to do is to carry on a little bit of the negativity, but at the end, try and suggest a solution to the problem. And I think the solution has to be primarily intellectual. Now, why, why are we depressed? The European Union is the biggest market in the world. We have the best educated population in, in the world. We have an infrastructure better than China. We have a tradition of innovation going back 500 years. We have the most moral society in the world. And I know this from my work in Yale, where most of the doctors there believe in capital punishment, which is an impossible thing to say in Europe. And we have enlarged Europe so that we take on countries that have transformed them from dictatorships, in Spain I lived under Franco, to modern dem democracies. We have incredible potential. The Airbus A350 took off last Friday from Toulouse and made its first trip. Fantastic. It has 25% less fuel consumption than Boeing 787. A wonderful European idea. Three weeks ago, two German football teams, Dortmund and Bayern Munich, came to London for the European final. Trafalgar Square, in the middle of London, was packed with 150,000 Germans, either in yellow shirts or red shirts. Some of them wore plastic German First World War helmets with spikes on them. This was considered hilarious by the English who mixed with them. I thought, how wonderful. What have we done that the Germans and the English are mixing in Trafalgar Square like brothers and sisters? So why has not this immense potential, the greatest potential in the whole world, taken off into a new society? And I think it is because our politicians are sitting around like wobbling jellies on a children's table for a party. <laughs> In the First World War, it was said that the British soldiers were lions and they were led by their generals who were donkeys. Mm. I think at the moment, we have a lion of Europe that is being led by a class of mm -hmm. donkeys analogous to, to the First World War. Yeah. I'm going to suggest to you, uh, Chairman, that the problem is the quality of our politicians combined with the intrinsic weaknesses of democracy. And the third element is a press and television which is primarily concerned about making money and gaining power and is being used by politicians to undermine democracy. There are some good politicians. Last night, uh, President, I had a wonderful conversation with Norman and uh, Mr. Sikorsky, who impressed me immensely. Compare him to Baroness Ashton, who is the external foreign voice of the European Union. What a weak woman she is of no presence. Are, are, are the liable laws apply here, Norman? <laughs> yes. Uh, of, of a woman of no presence, of intellectual weakness, of no vision that was put in place by a cynical British mm. government. I would like to sack her and bring Sikorsky into that position in, <laughs> the, in, in the European <laughs> Union. <laughs> So, but why are politicians like this? I think it's the nature of political parties that are the problem, not the politicians themselves. Political parties started in the 19th century, and if you read the English author Trollope, he describes their development over a dozen novels. Mm. And mostly they were concerned with particular issues, church and state, city versus countryside and politicians would go from one to another depending upon the issue. In the 20th century, they became concreted into organizations related to class. There was lower class parties throughout Europe, 
uh, related to Marxism. And there were higher class parties <coughs> throughout Europe. There was a polarization. And then in the 21st century, those quite noble uh, two class systems have changed into self serving, self interesting, short term vision organizations where the objective of the members is to keep themselves in pay and power at any cost. So all nobility has been lost from the nature of the political party. Some of us thought that the rise of small parties at the beginning of the 21st century, some of which have already been uh, mentioned in Greece, the Northern League in Italy, UKIP in the United Kingdom, might stimulate change, but no, as the previous speakers have said, most of these are right-wing parties, and instead of responding mm. to them intellectually with nobility mm. and strength, mm. our parties have shifted the, towards them for their own self-interest. Now, all, many, all parties employ spin doctors. Do you know what that is in Polish? Is there a... Spin doctor. Spin doctor, present? <laughs> spin, spin doctors. And quite openly, Mr. Cameron has three spin doctors. Mr. Clegg has three spin doctors. Now, I'm a cardiologist. When you come to me with heart disease, what you want is the truth. You don't want me to employ a spin doctor to explain <laughs> to you how your heart disease might be manipulated for my financial gain. You want the truth. Why should politicians behave differently from doctors. <coughs> I cannot understand the difference. Now, these corrupt politicians, corrupt, yes, corrupt, morally corrupt, if not financially corrupt, achieve their power by exploiting the soft nature of democracy. In a totalitarian state, it is difficult to manipulate the structure. Because of the very nature of democracy, it is soft. And we've already heard that in the South, an immature and credulous electorate. Susanna, you didn't mention that. I think that's the fundamental problem, is the Greek himself or herself is self-interested, is credulous. Compare Greece to Finland. Finland is a member of the Euro, Finland's had an economic crisis. Why is Finland different from Greece? I'm going to come back to that later, but it's an interesting problem, Susanna, for you to put to your... True Finns. So True Finns. 20%. True. Well, I'll, I'll come back to it later. In the north, there's been a more sophisticated <coughs> manipulation of the electorate. In, in, in my own country, UKIP has arisen, which is a right-wing party that wants to take the United Kingdom out of the European Union. To go where? I've no idea. Form a federation with Iceland and the Faroe Islands? I, I've no idea <laughs> what would happen to us. But, for, for example, the Conservative Party put a bill before Parliament that cigarette packets, for the good of the people, should be in plain Packages. That was the advice of all the doctors and the cardiologists, including me. Now, the president of the UKIP party was seen on television smoking a cigarette. Therefore, the Conservative Party have dropped the bill to put plain packaging on cigarettes. How <laughs> utterly cynical, stupid. If a four-year-old child behaved like that, you'd say, don't be silly. Where does the truth lie? Look at Berlusconi in Italy. Look at his use of semi-naked women on the television to get the male population to watch his programs. But the credulous, uneducated Italians voted for him a second time, <coughs> as the Greeks had done. So we have a malignant stew of apathetic cynicism with politicians leading the electorate towards castration. That's a powerful statement. 
But that is what it is. In Russia, even, I was privileged to uh, be in Moscow last year, where I uh, had a couple of days with Putin's doctor. And it was quite clear, without giving away any secrets, that Putin came to power by originally manipulating Yeltsin's alcoholism so that he could get a position in the political structure. That really, Norman, is the ultimate in political cynicism. But there are good politicians. I mentioned Sikorsky. The sort of politicians we need now are men like Churchill. Churchill disregard a political party. Twice he moved parties. And his greatest act, I believe, was in 1940, when France had been <coughs> overrun by the Nazis. He suggested that France and England should become one country with one parliament, and he invited all the French members of parliament to come and sit in Westminster. This was at a time when members of his own cabinet, particularly Lord Halifax, were suggesting that there should be a deal done with Hitler. He had vision, and I'll come back to this, this is what we need, Judy. He had vision of a new world, he was courageous, he was outside the political party system, and he did what he believed in in saying that. It didn't come off, but I think it was one of the most glorious moments in, in English history. What if the president of the European Commission was Winston Churchill at this moment? Where could Europe go? It is so farcical to think it, because there is nobody even uh, coming near him. Now, what's the solution with politicians? I, as a doctor, took a Hippocratic oath that the good of my patients should come before my own good. And this is something that's given me great fulfillment in my life. Why shouldn't politicians take an equivalent of a Hippocratic oath? Why do we just allow them to be this cynical jelly wobbling in our society? I am regulated by the General Medical Council that if I stray from my Hippocratic oath, they'd strike me off. Why, President, is there not a structure in each country which might not regulate politicians in the same way as I am regulated as a doctor? If I'd behaved like many politicians have behaved recently, as a doctor, I would now be in prison, without doubt. So, I suggest that we might uh, regulate the, uh, the careers of politicians. How, I don't quite see. But it is a very good idea, Judy. Now, democracy. Plato already pointed out in the Republic that there were problems in democracy. He says, we have a ship. Truly, true democracy would mean that every sailor would be the captain of the ship for one day. Clearly, that would be disastrous. So there has to be some delegation of powers in democracy. I think the, the height of European democracy <coughs> occurred in Iceland in the year 1000, when the Icelandic parliament voted not to be pagans, but to become Christians. And the parliament was every Icelander over the age of 16, who gathered together in a great field, had a two days de debate, and then voted. The participation of every citizen like that is ideal, but not now possible. And the softness of democracy comes from its strength, the ability of citizens to change, but the ability of a cynical press to manipulate <coughs> a credulous and uneducated population. I think we need more paternalism from noble politicians. I, as a doctor, become more and more paternalistic as I grow older, because my dying patient often says to me, 
Doctor, don't give me the choices. Please don't talk to me about that. Just do the best for me. I think we need politicians that we can trust to say, look, I don't understand economics. I don't know whether we need another aircraft carrier or not. Just do the best for me. So we have to create a new class of politicians. The only way I can see we can do that is by regulating them. So only the right sort of people come into that profession. And I think that the education with the humanities is probably the best way to produce that sort of human being. We have too many politicians who go straight into economics, into banking, and then age 22 or 23, become politicians. This happens in my country. And their only role in life is to be a politician. And they've never read Plato or Trollope. We need to make sure that in this regulation they have a proper training in the humanities. I think the height of democracy in Europe was probably the Benedictine monastery of the early Middle Ages, where you had true men of nobility, men who wanted to do something good, and they would vote together for the new abbot of the monastery. The only problem with that with that would be the vow of celibacy, which I certainly would have found very difficult at that time. Now, compare Finland to Greece. They have both <coughs> suffered a bit. The Finns had interminable, difficult war with the Russians that they won. The Greeks had their wars with the Ottomans, which eventually uh, they, that they won. But what's the difference between Finland and Greece? I accept that there's a, a, a small right-wing uh, element uh, in Finland. I know Finland very well. But there is an immense stability in Finnish society that I don't find in Greek society. There's uh, an economic stability. There's the highest standard of living in Europe. But what's the difference? Is it their diet? Uh, Finnish food is awful. Uh, Greek food is super. <laughs> Uh, is it corruption? There is no corruption in Finland. There is corruption in Greece. Is it their education? The, the Finns are extremely well educated with teachers having as high a status in society as professors of cardiology. There is social solidarity in Finland that I don't find uh, in, in Greece. Is it the weather? It's very cold in Finland. It's very hot in Greece. Is it a difference in genes? Do we, do, do we imply that perhaps genetic differences might lead to differences in politicians and differences in how democracy is applied? I don't know. I'll get on a little bit, Norman. I'll, I'll leave out my diatribe about the, the, the analogy between clinical medicine and, and uh, democracy. Uh, another problem with <coughs> applying democracy is a heterodox society. And at the moment, we see that in, in <coughs> Turkey, where we have a 48, 52% split between a primarily conservative Muslim part of society and a modern part of society. And we're seeing how that's very, very difficult to deal with in a society without an ancient <coughs> tradition of democracy. My country is split nearly 50-50 between two parties, but the other party accepts the, the, the party that has been uh, voted for. I think a solution to this problem of democracy is a structural change whereby we agree to the delegation of more decision-making power to unelected technical bodies. Did you write that down, Judy? It's a, no, a, 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 long, a, long, a, long, a long sentence. Uh, thus, I don't know anything about economics. And I think it's very unreasonable that politicians should decide on economic policy changing their mind from month 
to month, which affects the value of my pound or my zwoti in my, in my pocket. I would like them to delegate power to an organization which is told, run the democracy for five, sorry, run the econ economy for five years. Here are the rules. We want 2% growth. We want this quantity of inflation. And come back and tell us. And technocrats do that, not politicians. And I think, Judy, we saw the success of that with Monti's government in Italy, where Berlusconi produced this economic disaster. Monti came in, who was an unelected technocrat mm. and fixed <coughs> the economy. So I think democracy would, would do well to survive by producing organizations like that and delegating power. We delegate power in law to judges. Politicians have nothing to do with it. Why can't we delegate power in a similar way for economics? Now, the accelerator of this malignant stew is the press and the television, who identify neuroses, often victimization neuroses in the population. I think about Rupert Murdoch, who owned the Sun newspaper in my country, who came to an agreement with Tony Blair that if the Sun supported Blair in the election, then Blair would not take the United Kingdom into the Euro. What cynicism, mm. what power of one cynical old man over the destiny of Europe. It's my belief that if, if the UK had joined the Euro initially, there just might have been no Euro crisis. Mm. Because <coughs> British discipline might have been imposed mm. upon the deal with mm. Greece and other deals. Mm. So that one man with what, that one cynical ploy might have changed the, the face uh, of Europe. I find lies in my press all the time about the nature of the European Union to try and undermine the belief of the credulous population in the European Union. Uh, I, I think I told this story last year here, President. I was walking down the street in London a couple of years ago, and I saw a newspaper on the stand, the Daily Mail. I do research on stem cells and the heart. The whole front page of the Daily Mail simply said, stem cell cure for heart attack. I thought, wow, amazing. Somebody's done it, got there before me, wow. I went in, bought the newspaper, came out, opened it, and it was me. I couldn't believe it. The cynicism and dishonesty of the newspaper, what had happened, they just found something I'd written a few, days be a few years before and amplified this in <coughs> into a, a lie. So what's the answer? Just a few more minutes, Norman. What is the answer? I think the answer is that we need new politicians that are regulated. We need new political parties coming from those politicians, and we need new ideas. Where will new ideas come from? From our universities. I see no other hope. The European University, from Copernicus <coughs> to Newton, has produced novel ideas over the last thousand years that have spread around the world. That is the history of the world over the last thousand years. I believe that we can do that again in relation to a novel destiny of humanity that could be applied to the European Union. But those ideas would have to be based upon a philosophical analysis of what is the European Union, what is the human being, and what is the future destiny of the politics of those two together. I think that my concept that I spoke about again, President, last year, of the object of politics is perhaps the fulfillment of the individual within him or herself, of individual happiness being the alternative to the political objective of infinite economic growth without end. 
And that will require a philosophical change within politics, and I don't see it coming from anywhere else but from our universities. Therefore, this is a rallying call for universities to think politically, to think about producing politicians, about producing new ideas, and about producing political parties from within universities. So, in, in summary, uh, Norman, I'm asking for a, a renewal to offer the electorate a new philosophy, not economic growth to decrease the vulnerability of democracy by delegating more powers to technical organizations, perhaps encouraging coalitions of parties instead of two-party system, and to ask that the European Commission should be led by a Winston Churchill. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> Breathtaking. <laughs> I wonder whether the interpreters have managed to translate a malignant stew of apathetic jelly wobblers <laughs> <laughs> heading for castration. <laughs> um, that's more than we've faced before. Um, thank you, John. Um, you want uh, politicians to be regulated, but not panelists, I, I, I gather, in terms of time. <coughs> uh, we have um, had a wonderful uh, series of, uh, of three presentations, <laughs> but we are a bit short of, of time. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, members of the panel to speak for one minute, and I really will stand up uh, if they go on. Uh, but one minute uh, in reaction to, to what they've heard, and then uh, we'll open the uh, debate to the, to the floor. Judy, ca can you say anything in one minute? I'm sure you can, but um, there's so many things to say. We have to, for democracy, you also have to consider the role of the lobbies. The lobbies are hugely influential the economic lo lobbies, the business lobbies, pharmaceutical lobbies, telecom lobbies, they are there in their thousands in Brussels, they are there outside uh, every, cap uh, every government in, in, the, in, the, in the capitals of the EU. And I think the lobbies actually undermine democracy as much as politicians don't defend the democratic values. This has to be brought into line as well. Lobbyists, now Susanna. Well, John obviously provoked me by suggesting there might be a genetic explanation for why some countries <laughs> have more democratic problems than others, and by suggesting that the problems of countries like Greece and Italy are due to having an immature electorate, um, I would say that actually their problems are due or stem initially from their political organization, not from some genetic characteristics of the people. And the political organization in southern European countries has traditionally been based on clientelism. And of course, what clientelism means is that it's the family against the world, it's not the individual. So your concern is not for the equality of the individual within a system. And it also means that what you're concerned with is particularistic interests and not universal rights. You want to ensure that your family mm. can enjoy this particular privilege and you're not so concerned about ensuring it for everybody. And this is where I think so I disagree with you on that one, but I think where you're absolutely right is that solving this requires leadership. And what you require is politicians who will go against this long entrenched tradition within these societies and will stand up and say, no, we can't do things like this anymore. And, and this is where, in these countries as well as in the rest of Europe, I think we're being led by donkeys when we need to be led by lions, as you so rightly said. I don't know about Winston Churchill, but the, the general uh, argument about leadership, I think, is a key. It's a key to what's going on in these countries, and it's a key to what's going on in Europe as a whole. Thank you, leadership. John, can you summarize your diatribe in one minute? <laughs> I, I, there's been a lot of negativity from the three of us. And what we need is more positivity. Mm. That has to come out of education. And the problem with our education is the seduction of science. I'm a scientist. Uh, as I was saying to Judy yesterday, 
we are entering a quantitative world of binary digitalism, where, where to measure things is the goal of science and society, of even the way the president of Wrocław runs the city, he's got to measure outcomes and have targets. This, in a way, is destructive for what we've been talking about, and we need more qualitative thinking in our education. Mm. Therefore, <coughs> my, 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 the summary of what I'm saying is we need to go back to mm. educating our young children, not only in science, but a bit, uh, uh, as an obligation, to quite late on in their education, to the humanities, mm. to learning languages, to reading novels, to having uh, an interest in art. Mm. That is the way we'll get a healthy <coughs> democracy uh, that will produce healthy politicians. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, uh, if you want to ask a question, I, I can see there are some, but can you uh, wave your hand uh, strongly, not only that, uh, so I can see you, but so that the, uh, the people with the microphones can come to you. Uh, there's a um, very good custom in Oxford that students have pr priority over professors. So uh, anybody uh, from... Uh, uh, from the back, the younger you are, the better your chance of asking the question. <laughs> I like to have yes, I think uh, the gentleman here is reasonably uh, uh, young and tender. Um, <laughs> uh, could you ask your question and, if possible, say who you are and uh, address it to one member of the panel. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Davis. My name is Matos Mazzini, professionally, College of Eastern Europe, academically, St. Anthony's College, University of Oxford. And indeed, <coughs> that is the tradition yes. in Oxford. <laughs> That's how we make uh, the questions go in. And I've got a question to Miss Judy Dempsey, because you started your speech with the Romanian case. And I don't know whether you're familiar, but there's a very interesting, yet very bitter anecdote that links Romania, corruption, and Poland that says that in terms of transparency ratings, corruption ratings, and all kinds of classifications, the only reason for Romania to appear in those classifications is in order not to let Poland forever occupy the last position. And I'm bringing this anecdote to you because when you were speaking about the Romanian case, I generally had the feeling that you were speaking about Poland, especially when you put the emphasis on young people trying to make their way out as soon as they finish university or even earlier just to go use the Erasmus program or any kind of other opportunity to go and study outside Poland. And shamefully, I need to include myself to this um, pro pro procedure in terms of seeking for better education and better prospects. But what is even more shocking is that this phenomenon has taken place in a country that liked to boast about being the country that deployed the Soviet bloc from inside. And we had such a phenomenal carnival and revival of societal mobilization that led to the deployment of the freedom bomb that eventually put to an end the, the whole society's block. And you said that what we need now is to mobilize the civil society, to move the petrified political scene, and my question is very easy, how? How to make people be active again in a country that is witnessing a terrible, terrible deactivation of social, social capital? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. If you can stick to your questions uh, as opposed to your lectures plus questions, uh, it will help. There's a lot of people. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, that was to Judy yeah. to begin with. Yeah. Very, um, I actually was really talking about Romania. <laughs> Let me get this straight. I mean, there's significant problems with, with the, the legal system and the bureaucracy on the Voivod level in Poland. Um, and I think the young entrepreneurs know this as well as, as you do. Um, to answer your question, how do you mobilize this civil society? Um, the, the young Romanians have tried it enormously through uh, anti-transparency campaigns on the television and the radio. And it has not worked because of how the radios are financed and the television and the media. I mean, it used to be uh, uh, the, the Western media that went in immediately uh, in the 1990s to Romania, bought it all up, and now uh, so-called oligarchs generally control m most of the Romanian media. And if they criticize or name, name and shame, the advertising falls. This is a terrible um, 
um, symptom that is uh, all over uh, the European press and, and other parts of the world. You have to, what you have to, uh, it's very difficult to answer. I, there's, no, there's, no, um, there's no easy answer to this. You mobilize a society if you need numbers, but you need persistence, but you also have to target the politicians and make them accountable and have have strong enough people to actually stand up in the local elections. You've got to start on the local level, not on the national level. You start to have to look on the, on the village and the town level and put in activists there and say, you mayor, you're accountable for this mess. You can't keep blaming the capitals. And there's got to be this constant communication. I think one of the weaknesses of, of our European democratic system is the lack of feedback between the society and the politicians. And you can't wait for politicians to change. I, firm believer that the change has to come from the grassroots. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. John. Uh, c can I uh, address something quite practical about Poland and young people? Uh, I know and love Poland. Uh, I first came to Poland in the first week of martial law, which I spent in, in Krakow. Uh, it was a wonder wonderful experience. and I've been back perhaps 50 times since then, mostly having uh, strong academic connections with Krakow. Now, I think part of the po problem with Polish academia, and this might apply to other parts of society, is that although people thought they were anti-communist under communism, they did not realize that they had been formed in a communist way of behavior towards each other and towards work. And many of my friends in Krakow who are professors who were anti-communist are still behaving as though they were communists and they don't know they are doing it. I think there's a fundamental mm. problem in Polish academia. Mm. And I think the solution, you, you ask, how can we change it? The solution, I think, would be to give people of the age of 50 and 60 who are in Polish leadership positions a document to read which would say at the beginning of it are you still an unconscious communist if yes how can you change that okay <laughs> so that that's that's what i would do nice thank you that's a wonderful t uh, theme namely the mindset formed under communism among anti-communists exactly correct. exactly correct uh, Orban. and a lot of the people in poland who think uh, they believe in Pravda, uh, they don't realize that was the name of the Bolshevik newspaper. <laughs> uh, and many of the things that they think of uh, are in fact determined by their earlier experiences that they think they're fighting against. Uh, Susanna. Uh, yes, um, this is actually my first visit to Poland, so what I'm going to say is not based on anything to do with Poland or Polish experience. It comes out of Greek experience, but it is relevant to what we're talking about here, which is changing mindsets and mobilizing civil society. And it is one piece of encouraging news which is actually coming out of the Greek crisis and shows that this can be done. In the past, under the clientelistic system, there was a general attitude that everything was expected from the state. You expected the state to provide everything for you. And it didn't come from below, from society. One of the things that's happened during the crisis, where the state is basically not there, and is no longer able to play a role, is that there have been a lot of very interesting grassroots, small-scale, volunteer organizations, for example, providing soup kitchens for people who don't have anything to eat, um, mm. which suggests that things are changing from down below. That's very interesting. Mm, that's very interesting. Norman, can I, can I just make another, very quickly, another okay. comment about that? If in, in evolution, Darwinian evolution, uh, there are tens of millions of years of no change in the fossil record. Then there are sudden changes, like the, the occurrence of the mammals, what one wonderful change. And they've all occurred because of some sort of disaster, either geological or biological. I think what we need is a bigger crisis. I'm looking forward to an even greater disaster to occur to Europe, either an invasion or a great plague 
of bacterial infection because of antibiotic resistance, and out of that might come the great change. But if that is so, we've got to have the ideas ready to give to society when that disaster occurs. Thank you very much. Uh, time flies. Uh, any more questions? Uh, there's one here on, on the back, yes. My name is Dobokowski. I'm uh, the MBA student and... Uh, we can't uh, hear you. Uh, my name is Dobokowski. I am the MBA student and uh, uh, privately I am uh, the investor advisor and business advisor. Uh, I have a question to Susan. Uh, according to the Victor Orban words, uh, we have this power uh, because of the media. What do you think about the case study from the Greece uh, that the governors closed the uh, public TV? Uh, it is against the uh, um, control and the uh, rights, uh, the public rights. Uh, do you think that uh, they try to uh, keep some silent in the Greece? Yes, thank you for that question, because actually we have a government crisis at the moment in Greece, and it's precisely over the closing of the uh, public broadcaster. On Tuesday, the government announced at lunchtime that they were closing the public broadcaster, and at 11.12, I think it was at night, all our screens went blank as we were all watching it. It was a most extraordinary, um, quite shocking event. And this is a very interesting case of how this is actually going to play out. It's one of my test cases for the European Union, along with the anti-racism law. Is this going to play out essentially as a question of economy and cut, cutting budget deficits? Or is it going to actually play in its democratic dimensions, which is that it is actually rather serious to suddenly, from one day to the next, cut off the public broadcaster, stop it broadcasting, um, and say, well, in a few months' time, we're going to produce a new one. Mm. <laughs> Which, incidentally, the government, judging by the very hastily produced plans, which were pulled out of a drawer and presented to the public the next day, when the government realized that actually this plan had some opposition, it's going to give the government itself the power to choose all the new uh, employees of the new public sector organization. Mm. Um, when I've seen coverage of this in some of the West European news outlets, some of them have been playing this as indeed a democratic issue. Some of them, them have been playing it as a deficit-cutting issue. In fact, although the um, public broadcaster is extremely... Uh, it, it's been stuffed with party appointees, mm by the two leading parties. So it's full of people who shouldn't be there, earning salaries that they shouldn't be getting. But, curiously enough, the public broadcaster is not actually part of the Greek state deficit problem because it's financed by um, a license tax which is paid through the electricity bills. And in fact, it's in profit. It actually puts money into the Greek state budget. So I'm waiting to see how this will play out. Interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the question right at the back, yes, please. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, well, I, can, I understand I, I'm not here to present can't myself. We can't but, quite hear you here. Is it better now? Uh, better now. That's Fair it. enough. Right, so, well, I can present myself as a member of the working class. I'm, I'm, I'm Polish. And, uh, but I was living in Ireland for a while, so hence the Irish accents, let's see. Um, my question is, um, um, we may all agree that the politicians do undermine democracy, but don't you think that the, so the societies, the European societies, let them, let them do that? That the societies themselves are sick, they are run by greed, and so are uh, universities. They do not produce people uh, who yearn for, well, uh, for wisdom and, and knowledge, but for money. Well, I remember uh, studying and my fellow students were not discussing uh, what wisdom may we gain from studies, but what kind of a good job do we get? And I was appalled by that, and I can see the same thing among the politicians, I see. They're not concerned with our uh, wealth, our wealth, well-being of a society. This, they, are, they, they seem to be concerned with, the, with the, their, their, their own financial good. And don't you think that the society itself is sick and itself lack uh, lacks vision. Thank you. 
Thank you. Did, did you catch that? Uh, yes, I did. I, I, th I think society is sick. But I think, uh, you know, you're a member of the working <laughs> class, you said. I think I'm also a member of the working class uh, as, as, as a doctor. Uh, I, I think that the sickness comes from quantitation, from lack of philosophy, even the fact that they want, uh, you, your friends want salaries to be as high as possible in university, comes from a belief in a quantity of money and not philosophy. I think there's a fundamental sickness in our move from ideas to measuring things. I think that's what you're talking about, it's just a reflection about that. The, the, the other tension in society is, do we need an elite class or do we need all to be working class? And I think we do need an elite class as long as the elite class is determined by competence, by ability, that being good at something, so that the working class can aspire to that elite class. And it's the definition of, how you, of what that elite class is and how you get into it that I think is the, an idea for the future of society. But that's fundamental political philosophy, <coughs> isn't it, Judy? Well, can I just very briefly... Um, you, you said you were going to be a bit more positive, but you've now just defined the society sick. I think it's... Um, I find um, at the, the pursuit... I can understand why people want jobs. Uh, I, the, it's... it's, it's natural. Um, what I find though is the, the extraordinary impact uh, globalization and what um, John calls the quantitative element, what it's having on values and the whole idea of individual respect. And I think this, the, the, the idea of values and decency of, of old-fashioned manners which did create society and which, do, which created a kind of solidarity as well. I think this is being eroded over time, not just because of the economic crisis, but because of the speed and the globalism uh, and the pursuit, the pursuit of immediate gratification. I, I agree with you, Judy. I, I had a group of school children came to see me three weeks ago, 14-year-olds, as part of their work experience. They came into my office and were going to talk to me about being a doctor. And I, I was looking forward to this. The first question was, how much do you earn? I couldn't, couldn't believe it. My reply was, I don't know, and it's not important. But th this, th this, this is the, the problem that you're talking about and Judy's talking about. And we can only get away from that by teaching them how to read a novel as opposed to teaching them economics in school. Thank you. Um, can, I, a can I say a oh, word? Oh, sorry, Susanna, yes. Um, I thought this was a really interesting question about whether, because we've been putting the blame on leadership in, in this panel, and the question was, well, maybe it's society that's to blame. The, it, it's, a, it's a chicken and egg question. Is it a problematic society that produces problematic elites, or do problematic elites shape a sick society? And does it become a continual feedback? And I think that there isn't a simple answer to this, but somewhere you have to break the vicious circle. Okay. If I may give one more optimistic message from what I'm seeing in Greece at the moment, at the University of Athens, what we're finding is that our students, of course, they don't have any job prospects, so they're not actually sitting there talking about how much they think they might earn in the future. They're actually really interested in learning. They're trying to hmm. understand what has happened to their country. And because I teach European integration, they're really interested in finding out how European integration actually works. They have lots and lots of questions, and they're no, no longer just interested in getting grades. Thank you. A uh, question here in the middle. Rustan Samailov, Wrocław University of Economics. Uh, I'm from Ukraine, and uh, my question will be about Ukraine. Uh, we were speaking about some problems about Soviet legacy in Poland, in Romania, and actually in Ukraine the problem with it is uh, much worse. And we can see it starting from communist having 13% in the department that ended with uh, still seeing uh, monuments to Lenin in a lot of cities. And uh, my question is, uh, what is your opinion? How can we uh, get rid of it? How can we help Ukraine to get rid of it? Because, uh, well, in the process of building democracy, Ukraine is still uh, a step behind. And uh, how do you can we uh, manage to build democracy successfully? 
Thank you. Well, Ukraine, key country I'll in the I'll be, future I, I, of Europe. I'll be very brief. Um, yes. um, thank you for the question. And um, one, um, the abolition of monuments uh, do not get rid of the past and the legacy of the past. So even though a few monuments hanging around, dis destroying them will not uh, do what you think, what, what they will represent. Secondly, um, Ukraine is, um, I, this is the positive side. The young people and the media is still very vibrant. I mean, you, you, when, you, when I read the Ukrainian uh, media, it is remarkable how they've held up against the oligarchs. Um, but the third thing is, and it is the, the um, Ukraine, uh, especially since the Orange Revolution, not only is it a huge disappointment, <clears throat> it's become so highly dysfunctional. And this extraordinary, um, shameful uh, competition uh, between uh, Yanukovych and Timoshenko and Yushchenko after the Orange Revolution, and now uh, Timoshenko locked in jail. It's just shameful how these leaders are getting away with it. And the reason why they're getting away with it is actually the enormous power of the oligarchs and the money how they underpin this. Your democracy is going to take a very, very long time. What can the, can the EU do? I think the EU can do two things. There's nothing like opening up the borders for the young people and for visas and for trade. Trade, trade uh, creates, uh, op more open trade creates the, the beginnings of an entrepreneurial class, not the entrepreneurs you have at the moment in Ukraine, who are the big oligarchs. To, to strengthen your democracy, any democracy needs a vibrant middle class, and that is a question of time and markets and access to, to um, markets. That's the only, I, I don't have a magic uh, solution, mm -hmm. but thank you. It's very, very good to see a young Ukrainian mm -hmm. uh, here. Wrocław is one of the places where you would expect to see uh, young Ukrainians, but the, the more the better. Uh, I remember the 1980s when Poland was in trouble, uh, and one of the things that Oxford University did, which ha had enormous uh, fruits in the future, was to invite young people uh, for short periods, but to see that the world can work differently. And many thousands of those young Poles who came over a decade to Oxford are now uh, holding important positions in this country. So uh, this is one of the hopeful signs uh, of what can be done. Any more questions? There's one right in the middle there, yes. Uh, Lady, the, the, the light is not very strong, yes, so I have difficulty seeing. But. And this one here. Thank you. So, so the, the question is, it's all very good, John Martin saying we need new ideas. How do we get the government to change towards those new, those new ideas? That's your question, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I, I think that the, the way we do it is by, first of all, having the idea Secondly, by her having a group of well-motivated men and women that are, are articulate, you only need a hundred of them that will articulate the, those ideas. And thirdly, they will use the media mm. in the same mm. way as the cynical politician yes. use the media, in a way that they know the people will respond to those ideas. For example, the idea I put forward of internal happiness being better than having two motor cars. I think people would, uh, w would respond to that. So the key thing in that is getting the 100 people, because the, I think the ideas exist. They're there mm. for the last 1,000 years in our European philosophy. And I, I said to you, those 100 people can only come from the European University. I don't see where else they're going to come from. 
Uh, on this platform last year, there was a professor from Cambridge, Brendan Sims, mm. who wrote a very good article last week in the, in the Herald Tribune uh, about European integration. So men like uh, Brendan Sims uh, and, and others, if you can get 100 of them together in a pan-European, not, let's not call it a party, but political mm. group for change. Mm. That is what we need. 100 Brendan Sims, 100 Norman Davises, 100 like, like we here, to get together, to concentrate on choosing the idea and then manipulating the press in a way that they'll know that people will respond. Because I, re I really think, you know, as a doctor, I have a great entree into people. I don't do any private practice. I'm a socialist. I only work in the National Health Service. And I see the ordinary people that come into my clinic with serious problems every week. Those people really are not interested in having a glass of champagne every night and two motor cars. If you could explain to them that what they really need is internal happiness, and it's the job of politicians to offer them the tools to do that, I think that they would respond to that. So, Dorit, thank you very much for asking a very important and very stimulating question. So, what's come out of that is we need a block of 100 mm. politically minded European academics. Well, I think we can get a 100 in this room. Yes, <laughs> agree. Next year. Agree. Um, yeah, there's one over a here. Qu one a over question there. over there on the, uh, the far left. Uh, behind you. I'm Rafael Koch, and I have just added my high school. I'm 20 years old, and I see two threats on these debates. One is the China that there was said that is running in the economic way, and uh, is good because people are working, but they are working for a hand of rice. And the the problem in the Europe is the unemployment, like we see in Greece. There are two problems, and I am the youngster, and these are two threats that I'm afraid of. Or unemployment, or the work I will have to work for all day and eat not much. And it's my question to the Professor John Martin to make me good in the, in, as, a, as a professor of the cardiology, and I'm the, the sick one that wants the opportunity. Thank you. That was I, I didn't quite catch that. I was think, thinking about the hundred academics. I'm no, sorry. Ah. No, um, I didn't catch it either. Um, there were two problems. One was unemployment. Yes. And the other was China. 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 Mm. China. Hmm. What, what, just ask the specific question about China again. Uh, there are two threats. One is unemployment oh, yeah. okay. and working, for example, 10 hours just for a hand of rice. Okay. You, the work is crucial for us. Yes, that's oh, I true. See. I, yeah. see. I see, I see. Okay, okay. So, 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 so yeah. two, two, two threats. Yeah, I don't think unemployment, I don't regard myself as being employed. I work very hard, but it's all good fun. I only do things that I really enjoy, uh, and I'm quite as happy <laughs> writing poetry on a Saturday as I am doing a heart operation on a Monday. And I think unemployment, we can rethink unemployment. If um, unemployment means you're going to become a poet or learn a musical instrument, then it might be a good thing. Again, it's a question of having the right idea and changing society. China is very difficult. I, I've been to uh, Beijing three times in the last five years. Uh, and the first time I met a very nice young female cardiologist. I took her out for dinner. I'm divorced, by the way, I can do these things. Uh, and and I, I said, what do you do? She said, well, I'm in the army uh, as a cardiologist. Where do you work? I work at the third Shanghai military cardiology hospital. I said, what do you mean? Three military cardiology hospitals in Shanghai. I said, oh, there are five. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, the Chinese army has its own medical service. It has its own hospital bed factory. 
It ha has its own pharmaceutical industry. It is a complete organization sufficient unto itself. <coughs> and I, I realize the, the power of the Chinese army. I think that the, uh, the threat of China de depends upon whether the Chinese generals, who don't report to the government but report directly to the party, whether they remain as they are or whether they become imperialist. If they become imperialist, we have a major problem. Uh, so I, th there are two solutions to that. Either we try and educate them uh, not to become imperialist, or we get James Bond-type characters to go from London and assassinate the Chinese generals. <laughs> Norman, do you want to say anything about China? Um, it's 30 years since I was in China, so I'm a bit out of date. But, um uh, my feeling about China is that um, uh, it's been developing so quickly over the last 20, 30 years, uh, it's hard to believe that it, there's not going to be a setback, if not a, a crisis. Uh, one of the big problems in the Western world uh, in the last 20 years is that everything appeared to be going swimmingly, uh, nobody asked what the bankers were doing. Um, part of the population was getting richer and richer at the expense of, of others. The gap uh, between rich and poor in Britain has doubled, I think, in, in 20 years. Uh, and because the uh, economic indicators were positive, everybody grew complacent. They didn't think about the future, what might, might happen. And then we were hit by a crisis. Now, I wonder whether in China it may be rather similar. Uh, as a historian, I can't believe that any country, uh, even the most populous in the world, can develop smoothly and rapidly without setbacks from time to time. Uh, and of course, when uh, China has a setback, as I think it will have. That will be the time uh, to talk to them and to start a, uh, a dialogue because um, people are not inclined to reflect about their condition when th things appear to be going extremely yeah. well. I, I think China's got two, two major <laughs> problems. One is corruption, uh, and I see that in medicine Yale, where I, I, I work, as Norman said, had an agreement with two Chinese universities to do joint research. They stopped it because Yale could not believe any of the information coming mm. out of the Chinese universities. Mm. It was all fraud. So fraud and corruption are major problems, and that, mm. that will hold them back because they're not addressing a reality. And the second problem is lack of innovation. They do not have a tradition that we have in Europe of creative ideas. A group of Chinese professors came to see me last year, and I was showing them around the laboratory, talking about our research, and I said, this is what we, we did. And the leading professor said, can you tell me how to think mm. that? Mm. How did you think that? Mm. I said... I what do you mean, how did I think that? We just think that. Teach us how to think that. Mm. And this is a fundamental problem, I think, that will hold China back. Therefore, in the balance between China and Europe, although they have incredible economic growth at the moment, I think that potentially, this is one of our new ideas, Judy and mm. Susanna, potentially we have the ability to lead by our ability to have creative idea. Thank you. We have five minutes. Um, Judy, did one, you want to say something? Well, there's, one, there's one question here uh, on the left, uh, a lady with her hand up. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alexandra Sava. I'm a student of Polish uh, high school here in Wrocław. I'm also engaged in the European Youth Parliament. You've talked a bit about trust, and I think it is a very broad and a, and a very important issue, of course. 
and I'd love to be, to be able to trust uh, politicians so, so that I don't have to engage in, in research economic topics so that I can trust them to do the best for me. But I also see a little bit of a paradox or a little bit of a vicious cycle here because I can't obviously trust them right now, um, bearing mm. in mind the circumstances. And I would need to wait until something changes, until there is no more undermining democracy, until the system changes at least a little bit. But in order for the system to change, I would need to trust. Mm. And people are scared, and I don't, I don't mean to blame them because of the crisis and everything. <laughs> so uh, how would you respond to that? What, what should we do to to make people uh, able to trust in the change, because we can't change if the people don't trust. Thank you. Thank you very much. Trust. A word from each of you. Uh, is, um, thank you for the question. If you think there's a problem of trusting the politicians, you should see what it's like to be able to trust your managers, that you can have a dialogue with your managers or tell them the truth when something is wrong. And in, it, it, there's a climate of suspicion and climate of lack of trust in most companies and organizations. And these companies and organizations are so politically motivated that they actually discourage trust and being open. And when you are open, you risk not being promoted. And I think this element of trust in the politicians is, is so, it goes, filters right down to the basic levels of society. And in order to overcome trust, it demands an awful lot of courage and it needs a lot of support as well on the ground level. And um, what I'm saying is this trust about politicians has to really come from, from lower levels and from the media that actually exposes the lack of trust, which is also sometimes lies and corruption. It's, it's, it's endemic. It's a terrible failure of human nature, the fear of speaking out. Mm. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I th I th picking up from what Judy said, I think that the question, uh, the question is not just trust in politicians, it's trust throughout society, it's trust at all levels, that you can trust your teacher, that you can trust the policeman, that you can trust the person next to you. And this is very hard. So what you have to do is to build a society that is just and fair, where we can have trust in each other. And that is perhaps the hardest thing of all. I think it's a very, very important question. Uh, and when you said politicians, I also thought about the Catholic Church. Very rare as an Englishman, I was brought up a Catholic. And suddenly, I don't know, I'm always thinking when I meet a priest, uh, is this a paedophile or is he a normal priest? It's awful. Mm. Uh, uh, because of the way a very small minority has behaved. And as my two colleagues have said, it's throughout society. How do we build a new society? It's all the time we have to answer these questions. I think the main problem is that we as human beings talking to other human beings censor what our yeah. true beliefs are, what our true communication is. And if we are censoring how we behave towards each other, we are encouraging yeah. corruption in the other. And I did this. We all do this. We all do this because of our Freudian development. I've had 10 years of psychoanalysis, which has been one of the most exciting things in my life. Uh, and I realized through that that the main inhibition of me encouraging lack of trust in the other is if I censor what I truly believe when I'm talking to another man or woman. So to create our new society, we all have to undergo a form of psychoanalysis. I, I don't see any, any other yes. way. But there are, you know, you don't have to do 10 years of it. But we have to come up with the idea of when we're talking to each other, we have to be truthful about ourselves. That is number one step on the road to what you want. Well, I think our panel is a group psychoanalytic uh, session. Uh, on the question of um, trust, uh, the best way to see how important it is, is to study societies, countries where it doesn't exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, my good colleague um, from London University, Jeff Jeffrey Hosking, who wrote the most successful history of the Soviet Union, is now writing a history of trust. Oh. Mm. <coughs> I.e., 
his experience uh, learning and understanding uh, how awful the Soviet Union was has led him to this general issue of trust between people and trust between people and institutions. On which happy note, I, it <laughs> befalls me to close a very successful uh, uh, session. Uh, on behalf of everybody here, I'd like to uh, thank the three members of our uh, uh, panel, Judy Dempsey, Susanna Verney, and John Martin. Uh, we hope to see you again. <laughs> two, two whole hours have flown um, uh, like the wind, uh, which is a very good sign. Uh, I think there's uh, we know uh, finite conclusions, but there's a lot of very interesting insights which will make us all think more about these things, and that's what, why we're here. I very much hope that we can continue uh, a similar debate next year. Uh, I'm sure that we'll all be in Wrocław as often as we can. Thank you very much Thank for you. being here. Thank you.